So welcome back to Mechanism Design. Last time around we were uh, talking about dynamic optimal mechanisms and the main insight that we had was that we can disentangle the initial information that the players have and their in future information. So the information they receive after signing up for the contract. And then you can extract the future information for essentially free. Meaning that to extract the initial information, as usual as in the Meyerson static mechanism, you need to distort the allocation rule away from the efficient one. So you would think that the efficient allocation rule is the one that maximizes the total surplus that you can extract from the buyer. So this is kind of a reasonable choice for the allocation rule in a revenue maximizing mechanism. But you have to trade off that surplus and the information rents that you have to leave to the buyer or, or to the player in your mechanism. So to provide incentives for the players to reveal their type truthfully, you must distort your allocation rule to some extent. So what it means in dynamic optimal mechanisms is that to extract initial information, you have to distort the allocation in the first period at least, and maybe in some of the future periods, so long as the agent's type in those future periods depends to some extent on theta zero and does not fully consist of the information that the agent has received after signing up for the mechanism. But as time passes, the effect of the initial information becomes smaller and therefore the allocation rule converges closer and closer to the efficient allocation rule. Now this was our main or these were our main takeaways from the previous lecture, from the dynamic optimal mechanisms. And today I wanted to talk about three other papers on dynamic mechanism design that would provide a counterbalance to that result, showing that asymptotic efficiency is not something that we should take for granted. And the first of these examples is the paper by Thomas and Worrell, from 1990. This is a quite a popular paper in macroeconomics and it deals with optimal insurance of agents. So you can think of it as follows. Agents in the economy, citizens, players, are subject to income shocks. So the income is somewhat fluctuating over our lifetime. When people lose jobs, their income drops. When people change jobs, their income might increase, and so on. However, the truth is, for the first time in this course, we, we want to recognize that agents might be risk averse. So they might not exactly like that fluctuation in income. Therefore, there is scope for insurance against these income shocks. And if all agents had perfect access to capital markets, to deposits and uh, loans, then we would not, then the agents would insure themselves. They would insure themselves up to their average lifetime income, they would deposit the excess income, and they would take loans in times of hardship. However, capital markets are not really perfect. So what if we do not have what if our agents do not have access to those kind of capital markets? What can we do then? The answer is there is scope for an intervention from the government, from us. And this is the main idea behind social security systems. So we are considering the problem of the government that tries to insure its citizens against their income risk. And the model goes as follows. We have one designer, the government, and this government will serve as a lender. So the government will well, effectively serve as a lender. In truth, you can interpret it as the government will collect taxes when agent's income is high, and the government will issue subsidies when the agent's income is low. This designer is risk neutral while our borrower, our representative agent in our economy, is risk averse. Both of them share the common discount factor delta, and uh, yeah, they both use regular exponential discounting. So the time in this model is discrete. 
uh, periods go from zero to, to infinity. We have infinite horizon model. And we assume that the agent's income is just an IAD random variable. So we denote agent's income in period t as theta t. And we assume that theta t in each period is, are drawn independently from the same distribution every period. This in particular means that the agent themselves cannot affect their income in any way. The agent is not choosing their education, which would affect their income level. The agent, once again, does not have access to the banking system to smooth the consumption shocks on their own. So we are not trying to eliminate the source of this randomness, but we are accepting that agent's income is random, and we are trying to design the optimal scheme that would smooth out this randomness, that would ensure the agent against this fluctuation in their income. The agent's risk aversion is, as usual, manifested in their utility function u of c, which is concave. So this means that agents' consumption in every period, c, is composed of their income minus taxes or plus benefits from the government. And the agent receives utility according to this concave utility function u. Now, one slightly non-standard assumption that we make in this model is that there is this subsistence level of consumption, c lower bar, such that under no circumstances can the agent fall below this subsistence level. Meaning, we assume that the utility for consumption levels at C lower bar and below it are given by negative infinity. So neither the government nor the agent want to be there. And you can interpret this subsistence level of consumption as a basically minimal amount of food, minimal amount of water, some very basic shelter, and so on. Without those, our agent will quite literally die, thus receiving the negative infinity of utility. Now, our principle is designing an insurance contract. And we will formulate the goal of this insurance contract as providing some fixed utility V0 to the agent. There are many ways in which you can interpret this V0. Uh, one way is thinking that this V0 is just the average lifetime expected utility of the agent in the absence of insurance, and you as government uh, can give them their utility but also extract some tax revenue in the process. Or alternatively, you can be thinking that this V0 is just the target level of utility for all agents, in the, for all of your citizens, and you are trying to build an equal society where everybody will receive utility level as close to V0 as possible. But this uh, utility level is, in this model, chosen at some arbitrary fixed level. So the principal's goal is to achieve this uh, agent's utility V0 while minimizing the cost of doing so. So the principal wants to minimize the expected transfers to the agent, subject to the constraint that the agent's discounted lifetime utility is at least V0. The way that we will construct our mechanism is the standard uh, direct revelation mechanism, namely that namely we will assume that in every period agent reports their income theta t and receives some transfer bt from the mechanism, from the principle. So bt in this problem is effectively the negative of the payment or of the transfer that we had previously. However, the exception is that our utility function is nonlinear, while under transfers we assume that transfer is in utility terms. So with agents being risk neutral, our kind of standard assumption, it did not really matter. But in this problem, if you are being precise, transfers and payments from the mechanism are slightly different things. So transfers and monetary payments are not exactly the same. Now, what we will assume is that there is perfect commitment on both sides. And this relates to how we talked about government being one of the only agents in the, in the economy who actually can enforce participation of the agents in its mechanisms. So we do not care about the agents being willing to participate in our mechanisms. But what we do care about 
is about the agent's incentive compatibility, meaning that the agents must have incentives to report their income truthfully in every period. Now, the slides go over this model in slightly more detail, telling you very explicitly about what the utility is, what the agent's incentive compatibility constraints look like, and how this model relates to the models that we had earlier in class, the more standard canonical models. Now, I will not go through them in this lecture, but you're welcome to go to the slides or pause this video to read through them. What I will tell you, though, is how the, um, how the optimal insurance contract looks like. So first, let's start with our first best, about what we want to achieve. Obviously, the optimal outcome for the government, the cheapest way to achieve a given level of utility, is to provide perfect insurance. To eliminate any randomness, any volatility in agent's income. However, in this perfect insurance contract, the agent would be effectively able to select how much money they are willing to receive from the principal in a given period, with no repercussions for one report or the other. Now, however, the way this contract worked, or would have worked, is that the agent would simply be selecting how much money they are willing to receive in any given period. Therefore, given that our agent is a self-interested uh, utility maximizing agent, they would always ask the principal for the maximum amount of money. They would say, I am really poor today, I got a very bad income shock, please give money. So this perfect insurance contract would not be incentive compatible. Part of the reason why it is not incentive compatible and the main reason why it is not incentive compatible is that in every period, we only have one, one aspect of the mechanism that we had before. Namely, we can only adjust the agent's transfers, but we, cannot, we do not have access to any kind of allocations. While in the models that we usually consider, we can provide incentives to the agent to select the optimal allocation by manipulating the transfers that they will receive conditional on selecting any given allocation. So the question is, how can we provide incentives to, for the agent to report their income truthfully in a model like this, where we only have one instrument in any given period? The answer is, dynamics implicitly provides us with another instrument that we can use, which is the promises of future utility. So this way we will still have two dimensions along which we can manipulate the outcome that the agent faces in every period. So we can say, if you are willing to claim a lot of money from the budget today, you can do that, of course, but this will hurt you in the future. So you will have harder time receiving money in the future because the tax rate that you will face will be higher and you will be eligible for fewer benefits and vice versa. If you are willing to pay high tax today, your future tax rate will be lower and your eligibility for social benefits will be larger. One thing to note, however, is that using this instrument to provide incentives goes against the goal that we are trying to achieve. Because recall that the best way to ensure the agent is to just give them constant utility over their lifetime. By using variation in future utility to create incentives today, we basically depart from that perfect insurance. So we are saying your future utility will be dependent on what you report today, and therefore you will no longer be perfectly insured. But we can have some middle ground. So we can provide some partial insurance, which would strictly improve the agent's um, well-being as compared to no insurance whatsoever. So in the optimal contract, we will have some payments BT, which are decreasing in agents, which are decreasing in agents' current periods report pay that he had, meaning that the more, the higher is the income that I report that I have received today, the less money I will receive from the mechanism, which is 
how insurance would work, which is something that we want to achieve. And the other thing is that for this insurance scheme to be incentive compatible, our promises of future utility, so VT plus one, will be increasing in theta hat T. So the, once again, the larger is the income that you report you have received today, the larger is the utility that you will be promised in the future by the mechanism. However, as I said, the insurance will be imperfect. Namely, the variation in payments will be non-trivial over the type space. And the same applies to promises of future utility. So our optimal contract is a partial insurance contract. Now, this by itself is not a huge result. I was not too excited to convey to you that. The more important is the idea itself. Principal can use promises of future utility as an incentive provision instrument. This is one insight that I wanted to, you to take away from today. However, the reason that I am presenting the three papers that I will be talk, presenting today is not only that, but rather that they are unified by another class of results. So in this insurance problem, the theorem that the authors prove is that the op optimal contract will lead to immiseration, which means that the continuation utility of the agent, Vt, will converge to minus infinity almost surely as time continues. What this effectively means is that in the optimal contract, the agent's consumption is front-loaded. The agent consumes more than average in the early periods, or the agent receives flow utility, which is larger than V0 in the earlier periods. But this comes at the cost of asymptotic poverty, as you can call it. So this comes at the cost of very low consumption later on in the game. Now, this is a neat mathematical result and with a very good economic intuition or very good economic message. But the intuition behind this result is somewhat not intuitive. So you are welcome to look at the original paper for it. And I will present intuition for one of the following results in the similar vein. But this particular result is a little bit difficult to prove even on the intuitive level. So I will just state it to you and we will move to our next paper of the day. So this second paper is, in a sense, a mirror opposite of the first paper that we just talked about. But if in Thomas and Worrell we only had access to transfers in any given period, and we used promises of future utility to kind of offset that, to provide incentives uh, for the agency to report truthfully, in this next paper by uh, Inigo and Johannes Herner, we'll have the opposite situation in which we only have access to allocations in any given period, but we cannot use transfers to provide contemporaneous incentives. And therefore, we must resort to promises of future utility as our incentive provision uh, instrument once again. And the story behind this model is that about grant applications. So we have one agent who is applying for a grant, and the principal decides whether to give this grant or not. The agent can have project of one of the two possible types, so either with low social value or with high social value. And both of them are positive, so the, the agent, the researcher, is in principle excited to implement both of them, and the principal would also be happy to implement both of them, if not for the funding costs. In particular, for the project with low social value, the funding costs outweigh the social value. So we will assume that C is greater than L, while this is not the case for high social value projects. So the incentives are such that in the absence of any intervention, the agent would like to implement, would like the principal to fund either project, which in our model means that means selecting A equals to one, while the principal only wants to fund high value projects. So select A equal to 1 only if V equals to H and not fund the project otherwise, which is selecting A equal to 0 if V is equal to L. And for the extra assumptions that we will make here, 
we will further assume that the agent's type is random and it can change over time. But the process that it follows features persistence. Namely, uh, there is pro some probability greater than one half that the type of the project that you have in the next period will be the same as you have in the current period. And with probability one minus row, which is smaller than one half, the type of your product switches to the other one. The type of the agent's product switches to the other one. The principal's goal is the standard. Principal would like to maximize their own expected utility, net of the funding costs, subject to the incentive compatibility constraint for the agent, meaning we would like the agent to truthfully report the quality of their project because the principal cannot distinguish projects with high social value from those with low social value. Once again, there is a slide that goes in slightly more detail behind how we do it and what the relation is to, to the models that we considered earlier in the course. But I will once again skip it and move on straight to the result. I told you that the result would be quite similar to the immiseration result of Thomas and Worrell. And in this case, the result is polarization. It says that UT, which is the agent's expected continuation value from participating in the mechanism, will converge to one of the two possible boundaries. Meaning that as the time goes on in the mechanism, eventually there will come a point such that either we will stop implementing any projects whatsoever and we will never trust the agent that they have a high quality project, or the opposite will happen, in which case we will fund all of the agent's projects regardless of whether they are good or bad. And the reason behind this result can be briefly explained as follows. So while the slides say that UT is a martingale, it's not truly really a martingale, but it's convenient to think of it as such. So from a mathematical point of view, you can get the intuition from the statement that UT is a martingale, which is bounded on two sides. And therefore, since it, it is a non-trivial martingale, it will hit one of those two boundaries sooner or later. But the way we can see this, the way we can illustrate that in a more understandable language is something like this. Let us attempt to draw the path that UT can follow over time. So we will have time axis and this discount agents discounted some of future utilities from participation in the mechanism UT. Suppose that at time one, we promise the agent some level U1. Then when period two comes, we must keep that promise on average. One of the two things can happen. So either the agent says they get a good project, which means that they will receive funding and some lower continuation utility promise U2. Or they can say that they have a low project, low quality project. They will not, uh, the project will not be implemented in that period. But the agent's continuation utility promise should increase to some higher level of U2. And the expectation of these utilities, so U2 in case you report to low quality project, plus the value of the project plus the continuation utility in case you report a high quality project must all sum up to U1. But let us for a second forget about that flow term from the project and just look at uh, these continuation expected utilities and pretend that the promise keeping should hold for UTs. Then what happens is UT will split like this in every period after a good report and after a bad report. So we are just having the same mechanism in the back of our minds where agent is punished for in continuation for a good report, for a high report, and agent is rewarded for a low report. Ideally, to provide incentives, we would like to continue splitting these continuation utilities like this forever. However, there are bounds on what the agent's UT can be. Namely, we can do no worse for the agent 
than just not implementing the projects ever which will give the agent the utility of zero but there is no way in which we can deliver on the promise to deliver a negative utility to the agent similarly there is an upper bound saying that we cannot do any better for the agent than to implement the agent's project in every period than to fund the agent in every period and this will give the agent some utility u bar which is the average value of implementing a high uh, an or a low quality social portal which is the average value that a social project yields whether it's um, high or low quality so the average between the two quality levels the implication of having these two boundaries in place is that we will sooner or later hit them if we continue splitting our utility paths so let's look at this history along which the agent apparently has repeatedly reported that they have a very high quality project and we say that okay from next period onwards you will receive utility zero what this means is that we will never fund the agent again which means that the agent's report at that point does not matter ever again so this lower bound is an absorbing state the same applies to the upper bound once we have hit this utility promise we effectively promise the agent that we will implement the project in every period from that point onwards which means that we cannot use any further utility promises to extract the truth from the from the agent so this upper bound will be an absorbent state and if ut is a proper martingale then the result from stochastic analysis suggests that almost all utility paths asymptotically will end up in one of these two bounds so sooner or later almost every path will hit either the lower bound or the upper bound the reality is ut is not exactly a true martingale because of the flow utility that we mentioned because of the utility that the agent receives from the project being implemented but the proof in the paper suggests that this property of ut converging to one of the two bounds almost surely is maintained by the ut even though it is not a martingale and this is what i wanted to tell you about this second paper so the bottom line is once again that if you must use promises of future utility to provide incentives because you do not have any contemporaneous instruments or if you do not have any instruments to provide contemporaneous incentives then you will have asymptotic inefficiencies so the final paper in this list is um, more or less the same paper as uh, the second one and this might so this Lee Matushek and Powell paper was published in 2017 and I don't really know for sure but I assume it might be the reason why the Guan Herner paper is not published because it is more or less the same thing or almost the same thing but yeah so this model is uh, it goes as follows you still have one principal and one agent you still have many periods over which they interact and in which in each period the principal chooses one of the or the principal wants to choose one of the projects and there are quite a few options now so there is the default project which is kind of bad for both of them there is agent preferred project there is principal preferred project and there is kind of very bad option to use as a threat because well sometimes we do want to have that bad option in the mechanism right to, to threaten with it but the commitment power kind of kicks in whenever you need to invoke that option the mechanism automatically becomes non-renegotiation proof uh, so obviously players prefer their preferred project so the only twist here is that the principal preferred project is only available with some probability and only the agent knows whether whether the principal preferred project is available in a given project in a given period so to be honest i actually kind of forgot what happens uh, if 
the principal preferred project is unavailable and the principal selects A equal to 2. But maybe the world collapses. I, I don't know. Maybe it uh, reverts to default project, which is more reasonable. And the principal's goal is the same. The principal wants to maximize their own expected utility by designing some kind of mechanism with the agent or some contract with the agent. There is a difference, a, a kind of fundamental difference to the previous paper, but which does not really affect the results in this case. It would affect the results in many other settings. The difference is that the principal cannot commit to a mechanism here. So here something will actually have to be sequentially rational. Uh, the contract will have to be sequentially rational for both parties. So the principal will need an incentive to follow up and deliver on their promises. And the, paper, the model is just a little larger than the previous one, so it has more different cases. But there are basically different modes of interaction between the principal and the agent. So there can be a centralization where the principal always takes the decision and it's always the default, A equal to zero. The, there can be this cooperative empowerment where basically the agent says whether the project is available, the principal preferred project is available, and the agent does so truthfully, and this is kind of the best outcome for the principal. There can be this restricted empowerment, which is the same thing, except whenever the principal preferred project is not available, the designer chooses not the agent preferred project, but the default. So this restricted empowerment is kind of the middle ground. There is, always, there is also the unrestricted empowerment, which says we always select the agent preferred project, and there is this total annihilation of the equilibrium path. And what the results suggest is that in the optimal relational contract, the principal begins with cooperative empowerment in the first period. So we are basically in this realm. We are doing the efficient thing. But then some time tau comes at which we switch to one of the other modes which are inefficient. So uh, in those periods we switch to either unrestricted empowerment, so we give all power to the agent, or we, we switch to restricted empowerment, which is the middle ground, or we switch to centralization in which we fire the agent and do the bad thing. But the point is, this switch happens. This switch happens with probability one. So in a sense, we also converge to one of these three inefficient outcomes in the end. And I guess that's it. So you see, this is the similar kind of convergence result. And we do not even really need the principal's commitment for this to happen. But then, yeah, so you see that the lack of commitment power here is not really that much of a big deal. And uh, I guess the, the, ineffect the inefficient behavior of the principal by, for example, selecting centralization and the default project always can be sustained by the belief that the agent would just never tell the truth about which project is available. And this kind of makes sense because the agent would always want to select their preferred project, rather than reveal that the principal preferred project is actually available. So this was an even quicker summary of this paper. And now to conclude these three stories. Basically, the main lesson here is, as I've foreshadowed, is to provide this counterbalance to the asymptotic efficiency result. So you see that, well, firstly, you can use promises of future utility as instruments through which you can provide incentives. The problem is, whenever you do that, you get the asymptotic inefficiency. And not just some kind of asymptotic inefficiency, but kind of very general kind of asymptotic inefficiency in which you converge to the very inefficient allocation pretty much always. And this is a kind of drastically different from the asymptotic convergence result where you could provide in contemporaneous incentives. So my, your uh, 
desire to reveal the truth today is generated by the transfer that you will receive today rather than by some kind of continuation mechanism that you will receive in the future. So any broad questions about these three papers? The question is, in the latter one, did they consider uh, having two kinds of punishments, a mild one and a bigger one? But this is kind of what they have, right? So there is this default project, which is kind of the mild punishment. And there is this nuke option, which is a very severe punishment. So the question is, is there a mild punishment? Uh, because if you would have that, you could follow that for some limited time. Basically, yeah. Let me, instead of answering that, give you another answer to the original question about the mild punishment. There is this mild punishment in one of these modes, right? So the restricted empowerment is the kind of mild punishment. We, if the principal preferred project is available, we select that. If it is unavailable, we select the default option. This is a mild punishment for the agent because the agent does not get their best option if principal's project is unavailable. But the, the agent does still enjoy uh, the principal preferred project somewhat. So you can see that as a mild punishment. And uh, so you can look at the paper. They build kind of the set of attainable payoffs, and it is convex. And this point is one of the extreme points. So basically, when you get there, you cannot martingale your way out anywhere else. You cannot split payoffs any further. You will, you will have to stay at that point, which means that temporary punishments are not optimal. And this might be no problem. Not. I was about to say this might be a general thing about uh, repeated games, but it is not the case because you basically have one period punishments all the time in principle. OK, any other questions? In the real world, you can use these results for evaluating what kind of dynamic mechanisms you can use. <laughs> but this specific one. So the main takeaway that you want to you want to have from here is that it, you kind of learn what the optimal mechanism here is, right? So you see that if you need to use pr future promises uh, as incentive devices, what you want to do is basically use them for as long as possible and to convince the player that you know we will cooperate for this amount of time and then our cooperation will have to break down inevitably so we cannot have infinite cooperation it is all a fixed time interaction relationships built on promises never last yeah yeah, so you do not have any particular tool to use in these uh, settings. I have not given you any, but you can look at those papers if you think that one of your pro one of the problems you face fits the framework. And yeah, otherwise use this kind of general intuition, general guideline. Okay, so with that, let us leave the realm of the dynamic mechanisms completely and talk about something completely different.